Thank you for that introduction. My name is Dan Lee, and it's my pleasure to join you at the Samsung AI Forum today, albeit virtually. I think you've heard a lot of interesting talks about artificial intelligence, and it's my pleasure to share my perspective on AI and its future impact and current uh, work on robotics. So let's begin. The main motivation of my work is to try to understand the difference between artificial intelligence and natural intelligence. This goes back to the beginning of my research career 30 years ago when I started working as a postdoc with Sebastian Sung at Bell Labs. At that time, we were very interested in trying to understand neural models of brain mechanisms and to try to understand how those neural models could be used to explain behaviors in various types of animals. In the same way, we want to try to build uh, computers and um, you know, computing devices that can re replicate some of those kinds of thinking processes going on in biology. And we like to understand the fundamental limits and challenges of trying to see about how we can build AI systems that can approach or maybe even surpass the performance of biological systems. And that's really the fundamental question that I like to try to address is what are some of the limitations what are some of the uh, st uh, challenge, remaining challenges in trying to build AI systems that can approach the performance levels of what we expect in animals and in humans? So let's think about how we can measure these differences. So one way we measure these differences between AI and human performance is to do man versus machine contests. And this has been happening for a number of years. You know, we've started back in the 90s with looking at how we can make computers play chess, the game of chess. Uh, more recently, we've had computers playing things like trivia games. And of course, the excitement back in 2016, where DeepMind built AlphaGo that beat Isadol in Go. And in all these systems, what we've seen is a steady progression of being able to build computers and algorithms that can outperform humans, the world's best humans, in these particular domains. So this, of course, has led to this big, exciting time in artificial intelligence research. And the question is, what are the limitations of the current approaches? Now, what we've seen then is that with these approaches where we have um, good performance is in these kind of virtual worlds, right? When we think about Go, we have a particular board game that has well-defined rules, well-defined configurations, and all the players know exactly kind of what the configuration of the board is and what happens when they place a particular piece in a certain location. Similarly, we've seen successes in AI in things like playing video games, where again, the kind of rules are very well known. The images that you're getting from the screen are quite well defined. And the computers then are able to understand quite, uh, with a lot of data, are able to understand kind of all the various uh, dynamics and transitions that occur in these virtual worlds. And this has really been the domain of success for AI systems today, is in um, environments where kind of the uh, inputs are quite well defined. We know kind of how the transitions between the different uh, states of the world occur and, you know, what the rules of the world are. However, we've had less success in AI when we deal with our messy physical world. Right? And the reason for this is that the real physical world is much more complex than something like a video game. Right? When we actually step out into the real world, we don't know quite what will happen when we step on that piece of ground. Right? We don't have a good model sometimes of what happens if that ground is sandy, or maybe that ground has some ice on it, or it's you know, stony, rocky. I mean, all these things will dramatically change what will happen if we try to take, you know, say a running step on that piece of ground. In the same way, we don't know the configurations of all the various objects that are happening in the world around us, especially objects that are not well defined, that are flexible and deformable and kind of can slide and can kind of move with different types of precision. And of course, we don't know the dynamics, right? This is really trying to understand all the physics in the world um, by building these models, and it's really hard to do um, from kind of prior knowledge to build these types of systems. And this is what makes kind of um, AI successful in the real physical world much more difficult and challenging to do than building AI systems that can succeed in virtual environments. 
And so this is really, I think, the domain that we would like to try to work with, is to try to have AI that can actually understand and respond and do things in the real physical world. So this is what I see as a next frontier for AI, is to build you know, computing devices and systems that handle the challenges of dealing with the uncertainties, the uncertain dynamics in the physical world, the kind of partial observability that you can't see everything at, at once, the, um, un, uh, you know, how other agents in the world will act, and then being able to adapt and respond in real time to changing events in this kind of ever-changing world and in our world. So this is what I think is the really the next frontier for AI is really to build these robots machines that can kind of respond to these challenges. And this has been a pipe dream for science fiction for many, many years, right? We've seen numerous robots that are in the movies that can handle these challenges, but we still don't have them in our houses or, you know, in our daily lives. And this, I think, is really then where the next frontier of research will hopefully develop our ability to build machines that can actually do some of these dream-like um, uh, behaviors that we're seeing in the movies, okay? And this is why, uh, as a next frontier for AI, to be able to marry AI intelligence with these electromechanical devices is really the next challenge. And this is why what we've done is actually at Samsung, we've started an AI center in New York, which I've had the pleasure of being uh, uh, at for the last two years. Um, and what we're doing there is we're focusing on building technologies, doing research, and building these machines, these robots that can handle and intelligently understand and react to events in the real world, in the physical environment. Okay. And so the way, how do we approach this problem? It's a very, very complex, complicated problem. And the way we break down this research, this problem, into various stages, right? So when we want to build a machine or when as us as uh, uh, animals, uh, biological machines, want to try to understand the world, the first step of this process is perception. That is, we need to take in information about the surrounding world from our senses, whether that's, you know, vision, hearing, smell, touch, you know, uh, 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 other senses, and to be able to take that information in and to make some sort of model or understanding of the surrounding environment. This is what we call the world model. And then from this world model, what we need to do is then to make some sort of decisions and make some plans. Right? Given the current state of the world around us, what should we do next? Then what should we do, you know, kind of a minute from now? What should we be doing an hour from now? What, we sh what should we be doing a, a year from now? These are the types of things that we need to do with our understanding of the world. We need also make these kind of intelligent plans. And then once we are able to build these plans, we need to act on them. We actually need to you know, carry out these plans. So then of course, then it's a matter of you know, physically being able to do the types of things that we would like you know, our, our systems to be able to perform so that they can actually change the world in some sort of uh, a useful manner. And this is the way, we, the way that we break down the problem in robot intelligence. We need robots that can intelligently perceive the world, that can make decisions and plan things in the world, and then to actually act in the world, and then to be able to complete this loop in kind of a, a real-time setting. That is, none of these things should take any, a large amount of time. Otherwise, by the time the robots figure out what to do, the world has already changed. So these are the challenging problems that we're trying to address. And what I wanted to do today is to share some of the methodologies and uh, uh, technologies that we've developed to try to address each of these different areas of robot intelligence. So let's first talk about the problem of robot perception. Okay, And what we mean by perception is taking in, again, information from our raw sensor signals, that is the cameras or the microphones or the tactile sensors, about the world around us, and then to be able to build kind of uh, what we call the uh, state, to, to estimate the state of the world around. That is, you know, whether that's the three-dimensional structure of the world in geometry or the presence and identification of different agents in the environment or to try to identify even their intentions in the environment. This is the idea of going from raw sensor signals to estimating the world's state. 
And a critical part of this in robot intelligence is to be able to do this very robustly to map input sensor signals to these efficient world state representations that then the ro robots can reason about to make intelligent decisions for. All right, so that's the first stage of how we break down the AI problem for robotics. So let me give you an example of some of the types of uh, research that we're doing at the Samsung AI Center. So one sensor that we've been uh, playing around with is the uh, something called a dynamic vision sensor. And this is a device that Samsung has built that basically is a new type of camera. And the way this camera works is very different from your conventional camera. A conventional camera, when it takes a picture, what it does is it has a bunch of pixels and then it opens a shutter. And then in this shutter, it opens it for a fixed amount of time, typically, you know, say on the order of 30 milliseconds. And then what it tries to then do um, is then to take that information and basically they integrate the number of photons in those uh, pixels and then builds a pixel representation of the world that's related to the intensity of light that it's actually integrated in that uh, window of time. Now, what the dynamic vision sensor does is it, it actually images the world much more like what our human eye retina does. Right? It takes in light intensity and only looks for changes in the light intensity. And then when things change, it uh, emits a spike, a signal that indicates then that you know, this, uh, this particular pixel has actually increased or decreased in intensity. And this is a much more compact representation of the world in the sense that if the world doesn't change, then you're, this new sensor does not have to actually output anything. And the rest of your system then will know that the world has not changed and therefore it should maybe still continue doing what it's been previously decided to do. So what we have here is we have the sensor that outputs these spikes that represents you know, changes in the environment. And what we then need to do for perception is figure out how to efficiently process the set of spikes coming from this DVS camera, and then to be able to say, recognize other objects in the environment and to estimate different properties of things happening in the world around it. So we've de developed a system that can take in these input spikes from the DVS sensor, process them, reducing the complexity of that information, and then to take that information and feed that ultimately into a binary neural network that can segment and detect the various objects in the input stream. This is then the method that we use to process the sensor information coming from the DVS to represent the state of the world around it. And so this is kind of a, a new technology that allows us to very quickly use camera information in this new way that's then able to you know, uh, uh, infer what's happening in the world around, um, around the robot without having to do kind of much more complex uh, visual processing. So that's an example of this perception problem using this kind of novel uh, dynamic vision sensor. Now, another technology that we've developed in the machine learning community here is to actually think about how we can do this kind of perception using what we call a higher order function neural network. And here the basic idea is the following, right? When we do perceptual processing, you typically think about using some sort of maybe neural network that takes in the input signal and then outputs, you know, this world state representation. But in our case, the way we think about the world, that is the state of the world, we can represent as a second neural network, okay? So the way this uh, uh, higher order function network works is that when the input signal comes in into the higher order neural network, that gets processed. And then the output of this neural network is a set of weights, the weights of which uh, uh, represent another neural network, which then represents the st world uh, state. So for instance, you could have, you know, say an input image of this plane from one perspective. The output of this neural, high order neural network will be then a set of weights. And what this set of weights represents is another neural network that maps points in three dimensional space onto the surface of the plane's object kind of uh, uh, envelope. So the three dimensional structure of this plane. So that's the idea, is that we can use this kind of um, dual uh, model of, of neural networks to represent the perception as well as the state of the world using this kind of uh, uh, technology. And the applications of this uh, method are numerous. So as I showed you, one application of this would be to take and say images of the world 
and then to output the kind of three-dimensional point cloud of the different objects. And this is one aspect of using the higher order function is to kind of generate these point clouds. Uh, we've also shown how instead of point clouds, you could actually directly output the surface patches of the object. So to get kind of more information about the three-dimensional nature of these objects and to be able to render them for say graphics purposes, we have uh, another higher order function neural network that can do this. And so we can see that the kind of efficiency of having this type of representation for the state of the object is, uh, is very good. And what we can then see is that we can do some quanti uh, quantitative experiments to measure the performance of how well these neural networks work, these higher order function neural networks work. And this is uh, showing some results on a standard data set called ShapeNet, where given input images of these different objects, the higher order function network represents the state of the object in terms of these, say, point clouds. And then we can measure how close the uh, output, the point cloud outputted by this uh, neural network is compared to the ground truth model of that object. And what we can see is that um, these methods are very competitive and also much more compact representation compared to other state-of-the-art methods for doing this kind of um, point cloud estimation. So that's a, another example of being able to use kind of neural network machine learning to kind of build very efficient representations of world models directly from sensor data. Now let's talk about the next stage, right, the planning. And here, if, you know, the robot has some sort of view or model of what's happening in the world around it, it still needs to decide what to do. And the way we think about this problem is, you know, we want to plan out, a, say, a trajectory for the robot. Like, where should the robot move in terms of all its different, you know, uh, joints and its legs and arms or whatever uh, degrees of freedom that it has? And so the way we uh, represent this is, is that we, from our world model, what we get is we get our initial kind of pose configuration of our robot. That's our initial state. Then we make a decision about where the robot should go. That's the final state. And then what we like to try to do is to try to figure out the optimal trajectory to go from the, our kind of current state to our desired state through what we call configuration space. That is kind of the space of all possible configurations of the robot. And what we then do is we can define a cost function. That is, some places to go are bad and some places to go are very good. And so, you know, some places have high cost and some places have low cost. What we can then do is write down an optimization problem that minimizes something like the integrated cost over a trajectory. And then what we need to do is find out the optimal trajectory that connects the initial state with the final state. Um, and one kind of typical computational way of trying to solve this problem is to take the configuration space and discretize it, turn it into a graph of some sort. And then what you have is then you have an optimal path planning problem on a graph. That is which set of nodes to go through in this graph to get from the initial state to the final state with the minimum cost. And that's the kind of conventional way that we think about planning problems in robotics is to optimize these trajectories by doing this kind of approach. But typically these things break down when the robots get more complicated or the environments get more complicated. That is the kind of optimization over these trajectories becomes a much harder problem. And then the time it takes to actually solve these uh, uh, optimization algorithms is too long for the robot to respond reliably. And so what we like to do is think about new methods using machine learning to basically speed up this planning for robotic intelligence. And so for here's an example where um, what we've done is we've taken a traditional kind of planner that I described to you, where we discretize state space. We do this planning in this, uh, on this graph in state space. This is called a, a RRT algorithm. We then generate a, a trajectory, this optimal trajectory, and then what we try to do is we try to train a neural network again that will mimic the kind of trajectories output by this conventional plan or used in robotics. And what we found then is by mimicking the kind of conventional planners, we can still do very well in performance on the, of, of generating these trajectories, but then we also have the advantage of being able to do this very, very quickly and, and robustly in a lot of new environments. Now, another way to approach a robotic planning problem is that we can actually have a neural network, instead of trying to generate a trajectory directly, we could actually have the neural network 
according to this kind of higher order function neural network, generate what we call the value function or the cost to go function in this configuration space. And what happens then is that we actually have a small neural network that can be used to map out essentially all the different locations in this configuration space. And then the optimal trajectory is found by just doing simple grading descent on this learned value function to figure out kind of which direction to flow in this configuration space to generate the optimal trajectory. So this is a, another um, example of recent work where we're leveraging you know, machine learning to be able to uh, efficiently figure out how to represent the value function of these more complicated robotic systems and then be able to use that to, to be able to control and to um, generate these trajectories for the robots. So then, then the, the applications of these methods is then to actually do something with the robot, right? Now we're talking about action. So um, the example I showed you where we learned, you know, this uh, how to plan the trajectories for a robot. Here we're showing an application of this, of having a robot arm using a very simple tool to pick up a set of objects. In this case, it's a set of shoes. And what the robot has done is on these shoes, it's never seen these shoes before. It's actually learned how to generalize how to pick up, you know, from its training set of shoes to be able to then figure out very quickly that with these new set of shoes, how to actually, you know, hook them in the right place so that it's able to generate their appropriate trajectories to kind of pick them up in a very uh, uh, rapid way. So that is the kind of idea is, is an application of some of these technologies to be able to um, generalize and use them very uh, efficiently on, say, some novel objects. Here's another example of a robot action control system that we've been working on at Samsung. Here, the idea is actually using a novel sensor now. In this case, it's a tactile sensor. And here, the idea is to actually have the um, robot learn how to take the information, the state information coming from the sensor, and then to kind of control the gripping force of the robot arm so that it can actually smoothly slide, say, this object in its hand to say reposition the object when it needs to. And this is of course an example of what we call dexterous manipulation that you know in one hand this robot is able to reposition and slide objects and what we're seeing now is then the ability to try to generalize to, to new objects and to be able to slide these different objects depending upon the environment and situation and what the um, what it, what it needs to do. And finally, some of the uh, things that we think about in, with these uh, uh, robot intelligence is the need for the robots to also interact with humans, right? So, so if you have a robot that's actually doing something on its own and you have a human in the environment, of course, we want to think about how to have safe and reliable interactions between what the, the human wants to do and what the robot is planning to do. And so what we have is we also have some research looking at how we can actually integrate the kind of world representations coming from the robot and trying to figure out how we can have it perform these actions in a smooth and safe way that will then assist what a human user would like the robot to do. And this is, of course, is an interesting idea of how we can then have better synergy between human users and the kinds of autonomous robot technologies that we're trying to build. Yeah. So what we then try to like to do in general is to you know, make AI so that it can actually improve your daily life, not just your virtual life, but your daily life. That is, can we build autonomous systems, robots that can understand the complexities of our environments that we live in, understand those complexities, and then actually be able to respond to them in intelligent ways so that they can help us with, you know, the tasks that we have to do on an everyday basis. And these are the types of things that, you know, we're excited to do and develop is to build the fundamental uh, um, the research and technologies that will enable future products that will really make an impact in our daily life. Now, this is still a research problem because if you look at kind of how far we are from a comparison to how well humans perform some of these tasks, we're still a long ways away as opposed to, you know, so something like playing Go or a video game. We see that you know our robotic technology compared to what humans can do. And this is an example of a of a boy that's able to stack a number of cups using vision sensors, tactile sensors, being able to plan out you know the trajectories of his hands, 
figuring out kind of when the cups are stacked in the right position in place, and then being able to respond to slight perturbations in the environment. We see that the, the amazing ability of a human to do this is still, you know, um, very far from what our current technology can do. And this, of course, is what makes research exciting, is that we have this challenging problem. What we like to now do is think about novel uh, methods and technologies that will start to approach building systems that can achieve this type of level of performance um, over time. And this is, of course, where we would like to get to someday. So finally, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues at the Samsung AI Center in New York. There's a picture of uh, the researchers and staff there at the center. Um, we're working on these challenging problems, but they're doing amazing work, making amazing progress in the couple of years that we've been working on these tasks. And you know what we'd like to be able to do is to try to uh, leverage this to try to really make an impact for your, in your future lives. So if you're interested in more details, I didn't have enough time here today to kind of get into all the details. We have a number of papers that have been published. Um, here's a list of some of the papers I described um, using kind of robotic perception. And then we also have some papers that describe, you know, how we can do some of these manipulation tasks. Um, and this is uh, the output of our research. And, if, and I'm very excited that, you know, we're able to continue this work and that we will be able to kind of hopefully make future progress. And of course, I'd love to maybe see you someday helping us out in this endeavor. Thank you very much for your attention.